welcome to the premiere episode of Mind-Numbingly Moronic Movies. I'm Kevin G. McGill, Jr. You know, in watching all the movies that I've watched over the years, I've grown to love the bad movies almost as much as the great works of cinema. I mean, bad movies can sometimes be downright entertaining, and the film that we're about to discuss is no exception. So without further ado, this week's Mind-Numbingly Moronic Movie, Terror of Tiny Town. Now, what makes this movie a guilty pleasure or a cult classic can almost be summed up in the first few minutes of the film. It opens with a man who's almost like a carnival marker, greeting all the ladies and gentlemen. We then learn that the film stars an all-midget cast. And not just any midgets, mind you. Oh, no. These are Ted Buell's midgets. In fact, the movie hits the cheese factor really quickly by having two of these midgets, the black hat and the white hat, square off before the opening That's credits even But back to yeah. that all-midget cast That's thing, which gets hammered into you relentlessly man, by the man. announcer, the fact that the cast is billed as Ted Buell's midgets, and the title screen that reminds us all of that very novel concept. In fact, the only novel concept in this whole cliche-filled western fable that the cast is all little people. But anyway, on to the plot. And the plot is this. The plot can be found in any western at any time. The villain of the piece, Bat Haynes, played by Little Billy Rhodes, that's right, he's billed as Little Billy, because, you know, it's not obvious that he's short, sets two already feuding families at each other so he can rustle their cattle out from underneath them. Our hero, Buck Lawson, played by Billy Curtis, who does not go by that, doesn't go by Little Billy, because as I've said, it would be totally obvious, and in fact confusing with Little Billy Rhodes, but um, he plays the son of one of the landowners, who is a uh, Pop Lawson, played by John T. Bambury, and it's the gal that he ends up falling for, because, you know, this is a western that has to have a love story, is played by Yvonne Moray, and she plays the lovely Nancy Preston, and she's the niece of the other landowner that Bat's trying to set against Pop, and his name is Tex. Yeah. Tex, you got some really just dynamite western names here. You got Buck, you got Bat, you got Tex, you got Pop. I mean, the only one that's really somewhat normal is Nancy. You know, that's not really a western name, that's just, you know, kind of a name. But anyway, her uncle is, like he is Tex him. Preston, but played by Bill Platt. And he's not Lil Bill, well, either. He's no Bill Platt. Time. But anyway, so how do Buck and Nancy fall for each other, you might ask? Well, it's very simple, actually. You see, Buck saves the day when her wagon, in her stagecoach, is attacked by bats, bandits. Okay. Now, now, where have I seen this plot device before? Oh, that's right. Back to the Future 3. I mean, maybe Robert Zemeckis is a fan of this film. I have no clue. But anyway, so as I was saying, as Buck and Nancy's love blooms, the feud between Tex and Pop escalates. Okay, time out here. Um, isn't that basically the plot of Romeo and Juliet, or West Side Story, or any other bazillion things? I mean, seriously, heck, you could almost change the names Lawson and Preston to Hatfield and McCoy. Is there anything at all that is unique about this film? Oh, oh yeah, that, that, that's, that's right, it's, it's got an all-midget cast. But anyway, uh, so as not to really spoil the movie too much, or to spoil it completely, the dude gets the lady, and the bad guy gets his comeuppance. In a glorious blaze of stock footage. The end. So, you may be asking yourself... Well, Kevin, what makes this movie so mind-numbingly moronic? Well, did I mention the fact that it stars an all-midget cast? I, I, I did mention that, didn't I? I hope so. Let's see. Uh, all-midget cast, yeah. It's here in the notes. Okay, um, well, this movie reminds you of that little nugget of joy all the stinking time, throughout the entire movie. In the opening song sequence, <laughs> oh yes, this is a musical, and we'll definitely be coming back to that point. But anyway, there's a blacksmith trying to shoe a horse early on in the film. But unlike all the other horses in the movie, which are small, so that the actors can ride them and look like they're riding real horses and not, you know, small horses, this is an actual full-size horse that this man is trying to shoe. And it's like, oh, the little guy's trying to shoe the horse. And then 
And Cass also seems to live in a Wild West set that's left over from a regular non-midget casted Western film. I mean, the doors in the Lawson house are huge and seem to have a second hole where the doorknob is for, you know, people of regular height. In fact, the saloon doors. Characters have to reach well above their head to swing the saloon doors back and forth. In fact, some cast members just walk right underneath them and don't even bother. In then, of course, there are the god-awful short puns, like this I was saying I never thought that Mrs. Clancy could be so small. And that one. Will you be in town for a while? No, I got a little job to do. And then there's this one. What's the matter with me as a husband? Why, someday I'll be the biggest man in this county. Oh, 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 okay, 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 we get it, we get it. The cast is all midgets. It's, 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 it's enough now, okay? Gee, you don't have to beat it into us. We understand. That's the premise of the movie. That's what makes this movie just mind-numbingly moronic. There's also another thing, and I've mentioned it earlier, the musical numbers. That's right, there are musical numbers, because any movie western with an all-midget cast has to have musical numbers, and this is no exception. In fact, the one song that sticks out in my mind after watching this movie, and in fact before I even decided to do this video, was Hey Look Out, and I'm not sure if this is a subtitle or not, but I'm going to put it there, I'm Gonna Make Love to You. And the reason that this song sticks out in my mind is mainly because the singer of the song looks and sounds just like Shirley Temple. And that freaks me out a little bit because that's something I definitely don't want to hear Shirley Temple singing. I mean, Good Ship Lollipop, yes. Hey, look out, I'm gonna make love to you. No, uh-uh, not happening. Then there's this song, Mr. Jack and Mrs. Jill, sung by Nancy and Buck. Let's go way up on my hill. Pretend you're Jack and I'm Jill. Instead of tumbling down into town, we'll go round talking of love. For I'll sing my song as we ride along down on the sunset trail with the stars to while we're side by side Now on the sunset trail Oh, come on! That is not Buck's real singing voice. You've got to be kidding me. Oh, well, mo moving, moving on to the third thing that makes this movie just so mind-numbingly moronic is Texas Cook Auto. He's the comic relief of the piece. That's right. I, I said it. He's the comic relief in a movie that is cast entirely of little people. And I know what you're thinking. How much comic relief do you need in a western with a bunch of diminutive desperados? But it's here, and to be honest with you, he does not provide much in the way of comic relief. I mean, he's mildly amusing at most, but when the movie is billed as having an all-midget cast, the humor is already injected fairly heavily into the premise, let alone, you know, having need for a, a cook named Otto, who you can barely see in some scenes, who is, you know, trying to make you just laugh. And you're like, uh, I'm, I'm laughing enough as it is because this cast is all little people, but I digress. So, there you have it. Terror of Tiny Town. You'd think that a movie set in the Old West and starring midgets would be great, but it's kind of, you know, lackluster after a while. I mean, the the whole novelty of the cast being, you know, little people wears off after a while. And I mean, how many... <laughs> Look at that. Look at him. He's so small. He, he has to... You know, it takes two of them to play that cello. <laughs> That's funny. I mean, how often can you laugh at the same joke, basically? I mean, it's a one-joke movie. The fact that the cast is all midgets. That and the acting is only, you know, you know, it's barely, it's not very good. It's, it's pretty bad, you know. But then again, the movie was, you know, trying to hook that whole, you know, little people cast. You know, it's trying to, you know, cash in on that. So acting is primarily, fairly secondary. So if you can track down this movie, watch it. Because there's one thing I can say about Terror at Tiny Town. It is, certainly isn't short on laughs. Oh, oh, okay, okay, I'm 
sorry, I'm sorry. That was very little of me. I, sh I should really apologize for that joke. Okay, en enough of the short puns for me. I'm starting to get a migraine. This has been Kevin G. McGill Jr. Join us next time for another piece of mind-numbingly moronic movie history.